Great, Maryland. Awesome, Cody met you at a spay clave. Lucky guy, that's a good spot to be meeting him. Ontario, mm -hmm. there's my Canadian. Oh, and Jordan's here from Nova Scotia. I was wondering where my Canadians were at. Perfect, all right, well, get situated. We're gonna go ahead and get started. For those of you who aren't familiar with Kevin Feenstra, he is not only guide extraordinaire. Kevin, I don't know if you've listened to our podcast that we did. How long ago was that, Kevin? Probably seven, six or seven years, probably. Oh, Does wow. that sound right? <laughs> it sounds like, like yeah, maybe, maybe one of my first eps. And uh, Kevin is one of the first people who really started doing a lot of the space stuff in the Midwest. And uh, I've been, I've fished with Kevin. He's absolutely spectacular. He is also the author of this revolutionary book. So we're going to be talking a little <laughs> bit about it today. Anyone here read this book yet or have this book, Matching Bait Fish? And if you go through it, I mean, Kevin, you take a lot of the mystery out of why we fish certain streamer patterns, why we fish what we do, how we fish what we do. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, your philosophies and, and, and your science behind this, but I'm assuming you're going to cover some of that in your presentation today. Probably, yeah. yeah. Okay, I hope we'll, so. Yeah. We'll take questions at the end. I'll be looking at on Facebook as well. So we'll go back and forth. Go ahead and shoot over any questions. Um, if you're on the Zoom call, please try to do that in the Q&A section rather than the chat. All right, rock and roll. Kevin, the stage is yours. Go for it. All right. So I'm going to uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kevin Feenstra. I'm a longtime guide from West Michigan. I'm kind of a local guy, but I've kind of gotten around the Midwest over the year and made a lot of good friends. And um, I met April at one point and we became friends. And um, it's my pleasure to do a presentation for you guys today. Uh, April kind of showed you my book. This program's gonna be involve some of the photography for my book. It's gonna also just have um, some wildlife photography and hopefully something for, for everybody to enjoy. So. Uh, I'm just going to shift over and I'm going to um, show you my program. It'll probably take 45 minutes to an hour. I can't really tell if people are falling asleep with this Zoom. So, <laughs> so I'm just going to roll with it. I hope everybody enjoys the program. Okay, so here I go. I'm going to just share my screen. All right. We got gotcha. you. Let's all right, here we go. Okay, so I, the title of my program is uh, Fishing Attractor and Natural Patter Flies for Migratory Fish. Um, it's gonna be geared towards the Great Lakes region, obviously, because uh, that's kind of where I'm from. Um, I would like to go out west and fish sometime, but I always seem to be too busy, so. Uh, that's the title of my program. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's got a lot of photos of fish and flies. Um, I'm going to talk to you at first about some attractor flies, but this is kind of the uh, format of the program right here. It's just going to talk to you about um, the types of attractor flies we use and also some of the, the minnows and bait fish that are in the river that we also tie flies uh, to resemble. I'm going to talk to you about how things, how things like light affect the fishing and how, I, how it helps me choose flies. And uh, also some of the river currents that hopefully can be of use to people just about anywhere. And I'm gonna to talk to you about fishing structure. So uh, enjoy the talk. So here we go. Uh, whoops, I, uh, I grew up in Granville, Michigan. Um, we call it the Dutch ghetto. It's a small, <laughs> small town in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's actually a really nice little town. Um, but it's grown a lot in the past uh, 20 years or so. But um, when I was a kid, I fished a little tiny stream every day I could. And unfortunately, when I was 14 or 15 years old, they spilled some chemicals in the stream and it killed all the fish. So uh, as a result, I had to find somewhere else to fish because I love to fish. And my mom would give me a ride to different rivers. And eventually, when I was kind of in my late teens, I found the Muskegon River and I thought, wow, this is really a river. And I saw the guys 
fish guiding out of drift boats. And I thought, wow, people can make a living doing this. I don't know how that would work. So um, anyways, I went to college for uh, four years, came back and became a fishing guide uh, right before I was about to go to grad school. So it kind of changed, uh, changed my life and I've been guiding ever since. It's been 24, 25 years. So this is a picture of the Muskegon. Um, she's uh, approximately 175 feet wide. It's a big river by Michigan standards. Uh, it's 240 miles long. And it's one of just many great rivers throughout the Midwest and uh, that I've had the uh, privilege of, of fishing over the years. So, so that's kind of where I come from. I live maybe five miles from where this picture was taken on a little tributary of the Muskegon. Um, I spend a lot of my free time not only fishing these days, but I also um, just like learning every facet I can about the river and my vessel for learning that has been photography. And I, when I was growing up, my dad really loved birds and uh, it was something that we shared. So I spend a lot of time photographing birds in the river. This is a heron just from a couple days ago that I talk, took a picture of um, spearing a, a rainbow trout. So uh, photography is just kind of my hobby. They say everybody needs a hobby. I'm not sure if a fishing guide needs another hobby, but I got one. So it's a useful one. So I hope you enjoy that aspect of the program. The big river that I'm on and many of the rivers that I see in this area have a lot of tributaries. And, and these tributaries are kind of the lifeblood of our rivers in the Midwest. A lot of times the colder tributaries allow things like natural reproduction to occur. And uh, the river I'm on actually is uh, the product has several uh, dams on it. So uh, and the, they kind of unnaturally warm the river. So if we didn't have these nice cold tributaries, we wouldn't have very many wild fish. But as a result of the tribs, we do have some natural reproduction that really helps our fishery. So, um, so anyways, it's a very diverse state. We have big rivers that are these tailwater rivers, but we also have a lot of smaller streams. And they, a lot of them all have really good fishing for migratory fish and also for various resident fish, which typically the most popular ones are stream trout like browns, rainbows, and brook trout, and then uh, smallmouth bass. Um, the Muskegon itself, but when people ask me about the river that I guide on, I tell them it's kind of a Swiss army knife river. It has cool water species, it has warm water species, and it also has migratory fish. So it's a river that's always good for one species or another, depending on what you're willing to fish for. So if you want to catch trout in the middle of August, it's probably not the greatest, but it's, you know, great for smallmouth bass. And then by late September, we have the migratory fish coming in and that goes through the winter. And uh, I fish for uh, our migratory fish until late uh, April and early May. And then I switch over to trout until the water gets too warm. So that's kind of a typical year for me. And this is a picture of one of our Great Lakes steelhead in Michigan. Uh, we have a strain of fish that we use uh, that's become um, genetically unique to Michigan. We've, we've had them in this particular river system since the late 1800s. And uh, they've kind of been left to their devices and have kind of become naturalized in this river system. And um, and, and around the state of Michigan. So uh, to the point that the only fish that they'll stock in the state are these uh, little, little manistee strain, Michigan strain uh, steelhead. And that kind of sustains our fishery and it, it makes it um, kind of unique to, to our fishery. So um, these fish are descendant of a California fish and uh, they grow to good sizes. They're typically a good fall run fish. And then we have a larger, typically 60% of the run that arrives in the spring. So, so it's a pretty good long run of fish and we, we really enjoy them. Kevin, I'm so, just gonna stop you for one sec. Sorry, just because your photos are so beautiful. Um, I thought it was just me that, who was seeing issues on the screen, but Rick has just messaged me as well, asking if um, it could be fixed. Do you see on your screen two gray boxes? The only two boxes I see are the pictures of you and me. <laughs> yeah. um, they're, not, they're not in my, I can still get the general. Oh, one just went away. That, 
really did that just fix it? Yeah, it did. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks. All right. No problem. Sorry about that. Just my uh, technical uh, <laughs> inability there. <That's> okay. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, April could tell you the story of us trying to figure out what I was doing before we got this going. So but we're here. anyways, uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about the types of flies that I use um, for our migratory fish. And, uh, you know, uh, our, our run typically starts way in pretty early in late September. And uh, when the fish first arrive in September and into October, our water can be very, very low and, and very clear. And it's this past year, we really had a lot of that. And even right now, our river is at a record low. So um, so anyways, during these early times, we use, we call I call them spay flies, but they're not your traditional spay flies. They're basically wet collared, collared wet flies uh, that have uh, typically some flash in it. And there's various colors of flash that work really, really well in this region. Um, typically for me, I use a, a dark colored wet fly, black or gray. And then I cover it with a couple different flash combinations, either Kelly green and copper, or um, you know a rainbow color, or uh, cranberry and pearl is a really good color in this region too. And that's what I'd use, uh, you know, till the end of October. I'll use a lot of these spay flies as long as the water is clear, and uh, it'll really help the, the fishing and make for some fun and very kind of classical styles of fishing. Uh, it's at that time of the year that we uh, really have some enjoyable spay casting and spay fishing. Um, this is actually a picture of one of our spay claves here, which is going to happen again this year. And if you're in the Midwest, you might want to look it up. But uh, it's, I think, the first weekend of October this year. But uh, anyways, uh, it's during these early, early parts of our steelhead run that you can get away with fishing. Uh, you know, a light floating line and a fairly light sink tip and, and you can swing those wet flies and spay flies and be successful uh, with the steelhead fishing. But as time progresses, uh, our fishing changes. And what typically happens for me is that I'll find a color combination of an attractor fly, you know, a fly that really doesn't look like anything in nature, but it's sparkly and colorful and just draws the attention of fish. So I'll find a color combination and initially I'll fish it as a spay fly and then I'll typically convert it to some kind of leech or something that I can get it to sink quickly as the water gets colder. And then sometimes I need it to move a lot of water and to be very uh, pushy with the fish. And so then I'll, I'll morph it into a sculpin pattern. So basically the way I tie flies is I find a color, a flash combination, that works and then I just convert it into a few different profiles that fit the way I want to fish on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, typically as the water gets cooler in November, um, you know, that's when we go to the weighted flies and the leeches. Typically these days I use uh, flies that are uh, tied on shanks and uh, they have a trailing hook. And I do that for a couple of reasons and I'll kind of talk to you about that as we go. Uh, today in the program, um, but one of the one of the main reasons is simply that they just hook fish really well, and uh, they allow the use of a fairly small hook with a wide gap uh, that doesn't do a lot of damage to the fish and that uh, has a really good landing ratio. Um, you know, just like other places swinging flies, it's not usually a big numbers game. I mean, it, it can be in places, but uh, but in general, swinging flies is the most challenging way to catch a steelhead uh, or a migratory fish, whether it's a steelhead or a lake run brown or whatever in the Midwest. And so uh, you want a hooking method that's very successful, and that's why we use the trailing hook. As winter gets closer, uh, the, the, the changes in the fish's preference of color becomes really obvious to me. You know, I'm a guide and a lot of times I'll have two different people swinging flies out of the boat. And for the longest part of fall, I might've been using something like black and green and copper or black and copper, but, and the person that's using that color usually catches the, the more fish. Or if one person is catching less fish, I'll give them that color. But it's kind of a funny thing that as the water gets colder and colder, the fish seem to really prefer uh, a blue color. And so 
the blue will become the dominant color of the flies I use in the boat. Uh, and uh, that's true of the tractor flies all through the winter months. I'll use blue and sometimes a hint of purple or pink, and, uh, but blue and yellow is very good. Blue and a rainbow colored flash is really good. And usually all these blue flies have a uh, color that's um, based, that, that overlays black. So you've heard the old steelhead phrase that uh, you give me anything and, and make it a, a black body, but um, the way I do it, I use a black bodied fly and then I just cover it with, with whatever flash I need. And that's kind of my way of, of doing things. So, and uh, that uh, towards winter, we catch these beautiful fish. Um, we typically get chrome run fish until all the way until December and then the fish become winter fish. And uh, when they do, they become more trout like. Uh, and they, because they become more trout like, I switch my tactics a lot of times, and I'm going to talk to you about that next. But we start getting chrome fish again, typically in February and March, and uh, and uh, when we get our nice spring run. So, and so the big shift for me isn't so much in the style of fishing, but it's the style of the flies. And rather than doing things that are just trying to, you know, get them to chase a squirrel or a colorful fly, I'm trying now to show them something that actually looks like something in nature. And so I, I turn to flies that are um, more natural in format and I imitate the actual bait fish that are in the river. I do that for a couple reasons. Number one, it works. And the trout or the steel, the migratory fish uh, such as the steelhead become more trout-like, but I also do it because a lot of times in the winter, I'm fishing waters that have trout and steelhead in them and the trout are kind of fussy about um, the types of flies that they eat. So when I switch to more natural patterns, uh, the trout are more likely to be part of the mix in the fishing. Uh, so not only am I hopefully catching a steelhead, which is a very small numbers game in the winter, but then I can add these stream trout to the mix and it definitely adds for, makes for more exciting fishing uh, as you go through a day. So this is a picture of one of the first minnows I'm gonna to talk to you about. This is, imitates an invasive species called a round goby. And up until probably 10 years ago, I never fished a round goby. I'd never seen one in our river system, but they came into all of our rivers. Uh, they, they are kind of a, another wave of invasive species, but of all the invasive species that we have, I have to say this, this one I actually kind of like. It, it makes our resident fish bigger. Um, it, uh, the steelhead feed really heavily on them. And uh, it uh, definitely adds just to the biology of the river. The only downside I can see to gobies in the river is that they um, do tend to compete with some of the native bait fish. And so where there's gobies around, I don't see quite as many sculpins anymore, but there's still sculpins. So um, it doesn't concern me too much. And this is what that fly that I just showed you imitates. This is a round goby. Um, typically round gobies are kind of a yellowish tan color. Uh, they have a modeled pattern on them. Sometimes they're just a straight tan color, uh, but they also get to be a very inky jet black during the spring, during the time when they were most heavily spawning. And um, I'll show you one of those in just a minute here, but um, gobies can be, grow to be quite large. This is a small one that's maybe an inch or two long. And this is prey to just about every migratory fish in the river that's a feeding migratory fish, um, i.e. steelhead or a lake run brown loves to eat gobies. Um, the thing about a goby is that lake, our Great Lakes are absolutely stuffed with them. So any predator fish that migrates into a river is already familiar with this bait fish. So it works really well because these fish are familiar with eating them and they just will continue to forage on them. And as a steelhead or a lake run brown is, is in a river for an extended period of time, they become more like a trout. They, they're just trying to survive through the winter. So they eat these natural foods and a goby is always on the menu. Gobies uh, do sometimes turn that inky jet black as they grow bigger. And sometimes I'll catch them while I'm fishing for trout like this one. Uh, 
uh, was victim of a trout catch, but uh, the steelhead really liked the Yankee black and Hey, you know, black always works for steelhead. And now we have something to imitate. That's a really inky black color. So you can imagine it's a natural fit uh, for steelhead fishing. And uh, they eat them. If you're going to tie a, a goby pattern, the one thing I'll say is that they have very prominent eyes on their body. So give them those uh, prominent eyes when you're tying patterns, whether it be for steelhead or for trout or for smallmouth bass. I fish a lot for northern pike with gobies. It's not your typical uh, northern pike type fly, but they really love to eat gobies. So, uh, so there you go. And uh, gobies support a lot of the wildlife on the river. Uh, here's a um, common merganser uh, browsing on a really big goby. I don't know how that thing got it down, but somehow uh, it did. Um, but also things like kingfishers feed on the gobies. I took a picture of this one just last week. Um, uh, it's kind of a fun, challenging bird to photograph because they're so quick and they're relatively shy of the camera. So it takes me, you know, you have to be somebody that's really easily amused to sit for an hour and watch uh, for a kingfisher to dive in the water. But, and the mammals on the river feed on them too. This is a mink that was feeding on a goby. And so in a strange way, this uh, invasive fish has kind of become a foundation of one of the main foundations of our ecosystem for fish and for birds and mammals. So, so once you got your goby tied and you're thinking of other bait fish that might work, this was kind of the flies type of fly that was the predecessor to the goby. Uh, this is a sculpin imitation. And uh, gobies are typically common in the rivers that are big and slow moving and attached to the Great Lakes. But uh, in the cleaner rivers, uh, or in the, I shouldn't say cleaner, in the traditional freestone rivers that support mostly wild steelhead and trout, um, sculpins are the main, one of the main forage species. And so understanding sculpins can help you be on, uh, very productive with steelhead uh, but it can also help you to be very productive with the stream trout through the winter months. Sculpins have some really distinct features. I talked to you about the round gobies and, and they look kind of like a sculpin, but their behavior is much, much different than a sculpin. The sculpin sits underneath rocks and is typically only active when the water is um, when it's morning or evening or even at night, you just don't see them very often. They sit underneath rocks, their camouflage is perfect, and uh, they're voraciously predatory. They eat other minnows and crustaceans and things like that. The difference between them and a goby is a goby, basically, they reproduce so heavily that they, uh, they'll sit right on top of a rock and uh, they you know, they'll get eaten, gobbled up by everything, but sculpins are still a really favored um, bait fish, especially by uh, the, the lake run brown trout that we have. Uh, and, and I also use them a lot for steelhead. So you can see by this photo, you can see how well a sculpin blends in. It spreads its wing-like pectoral fins and it blends in almost perfectly with the bottom of the river. And so the coloration of any of these bait fish from above is something that you always want to keep take account of. Sculpins are what a one of what of this is kind of my seafood platter kind of picture. I turned over a rock and there was a sculpin with two crayfish on top of them. But um, my point of this image is that if you ever go to a river that you haven't fished before, uh, anywhere in the Midwest, and I'm guessing probably anywhere there's trout or steelhead species. If you want to find a way to catch resident fish and nothing in your box seems to be working, look at the bottom of the river and then match the color of your fly to the bottom of the river. Chances are there's some kind of uh, bottom dwelling fish that resembles the bottom of the river that the fish will eat. And the same goes for crayfish and uh, basically anything that makes its living or along the bottom of the river will blend in really well with the river bottom. And sculpins uh, are often found in some of the really rocky, uh, slow areas of a river. And so when you're, when you're fishing, a sculpin is a perfect match because that's where the kind of habitat that sculpins like. 
And so you can fish a sculpin very slowly to be successful through these slow rocky areas. And that's why it lends itself so well to winter fishing because um, you can fish them at a speed that a steelhead will still track down and, and, and attack, you know, because they're a slow moving, uh, something that you can tie naturally and, and fish it slowly. So hopefully that makes sense. But as I move to another type of fly that I really love to use, I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, shiner patterns. This is a pattern I believe I'll be tying with April next week. I call it a code breaker, but it's a, it's a basic, uh, shiner pattern uh, that I use for just about every type of migratory fish. It's actually something I, I am morphed out of a smallmouth fly and it basically imitates the wide variety of shiners that we have in our river. And they are always there. They uh, um, typically are a major forage uh, in areas that would normally have weed beds in the summer. When the weed beds die, the, the uh, bait fish have to find places to live and they typically reside in some of the deeper pools in the river and some of the um, slower areas. So again, they make a great uh, winter target, but they're also basically anytime a steelhead's in a river or a brown trout, they're just a great way to search for a fish, especially if you're having difficulty with the more razzle dazzly type flies. So, and uh, they are by far my favorite way to uh, catch a lake run brown. This is a really big brown I caught on a super, super cold lake run on a super, super cold day this past January. Uh, I was fishing by myself and I hooked it and I thought, man, that feels like a really big fish. And uh, anyways, I, I don't usually take underwater pictures in the, on a 19 degree day, but with a, a big brown, I thought I better do it. So anyways, um, lake run browns will readily take these shiner patterns. Uh, they love them on the swung fly. Um, lake run browns compared to steelhead are a little different, you know, there are certain natural flies that they'll take really well swung, but um, if you really want to catch numbers of lake run browns specifically in my neck of the woods, uh, a stripped fly will actually do better with that. And there's people that throw giant flies and catch um, a, a good number of lake run browns. And when I actually first started guiding for years, I caught more lake run browns and steelhead because a lot of my, my game early on was stripping flies and I shifted only over to swung flies when I you know, became more and more confident in it. So um, shiners in general turn really bright colors in the spring as they prepare to spawn. So if you're fishing migratory fish into the spring in a river system, it's good to know the colors of the spawning shiners that are around. Um, as the steel had kind of concluded their run and I'm targeting trout and resident trout and steelhead. Uh, I'll frequently use flies that are kind of a rosy copper color in May. And that's because a lot of the shiners are getting into their spawning color. And these common shiners turn a bright copper color. So, so as I head to the next uh, bait fish I'll talk to you about, this is something that you probably have just about everywhere um, that you have runs of migratory and fish. And this is, uh, the prodigy, pro progeny of um, the migratory fish, they're fry. And uh, fry make up probably, oh, I don't know, two or three months of my business just fishing various fry patterns, first for the migratory fish and then a lot swinging them as wet flies for um, resident trout. So a, a lot of our rivers reproduce uh, trout really well and steelhead in particular reproduce pretty well um, unfortunately, in some of the rivers, the, the uh, survival rate's kind of low because the water temperature in the summer will kill them. And so, um, but, it, but a lot of our rivers just have a tremendous volume of these one to two inch long fry uh, through the late winter with salmon fry and then through the spring uh, with steelhead fry. And so they become a primary food source during those times. Um, you know, our steelhead a lot of times will spawn up just the tiniest, tiniest tributary. This is a drop back steelhead coming through a big log that's been carved out. And uh, the water, what typically happens with, with migratory fish is that, especially with our steelhead, is that they'll run up these little tiny 
creeks if we have high water in the late winter and spring and they'll spawn but those creeks drop really quickly when the water dries up so uh those steelhead will be sucked out uh almost like a conveyor belt out of the river uh and they'll end up in the mainstream but their net result a lot of times in these small cold creeks is the wild fish that we have in our rivers and interestingly enough when you have wild steelhead fry or wild salmon fry we also have a native bait fish that looks a lot like them even though it's totally different family of fish and it's called a darter and so in a lot of ways we can tie flies that not only imitate the fry but imitate these darters at the same time and both of them are very good food sources for the, the game fish that are present so my point with this photo is that anytime you can get away with killing more than one food source with one st stone, you're, you're good. Basically, if you can make a fly that imitates two things that fish like to eat at the same time, you're well off doing it. And so that's what we often do. Um, these darters can be stunningly colorful, even when they're the same uh, size as those fry. This is a rainbow darter in the spring. Um, Again, another really good forage uh, source. In the river that I'm on, they make a pretty high percentage, these rainbow darters of the forage in the river. And so oftentimes we'll tie these little flies. Um, I call it an inside bender. It's only an inch and a half to two inches long. And uh, it, it, it imitates generically the uh, salmon and steelhead fry in the river, but it also really well, it does a really good job of imitating the darters. And in that way, uh, you can typically catch a lot of different fish. It accounts for a lot of my steelhead late in the winter, uh, but it's also one of those flies that I mentioned earlier that can take the stream trout at the same time. So it's really a win-win for me to fish this pattern. And interestingly, this particular pattern, I can tie and fish as a swung fly, but if I need to fish a nymph, I can actually tie it as a nymph on a straight shanked hook and it works just as well. So it's a real benefit to my fishing to have these kind of multi-species uh, imitations. This is a picture of a king salmon with a little steelhead fry in the background. Um, interesting thing about our king salmon is that they reproduce really well. Most of the king salmon that we have in Michigan are, are, nat are wild fish, they're naturally reproduced. And the reason being that they reproduce uh, in the fall and their young hatches typically by late winter. And then their young is already heading out um, to, to, to Lake Michigan by the time a river might get too warm to support them. So they have a better reproduction rate than our steelhead do in this state. But, uh, but the, the nice, the thing about king salmon is you always wanna have a size of bait fish imitation in your box that imitates both the king salmon and then a smaller one that might imitate the fry or maybe a darter. So uh, it helps to have various sizes of these flies. And even as we head into late spring, there's another species that hatches like crazy and it is sucker fry. And it's probably the most neglected food source in our rivers. Um, but we use these for steelhead initially, but then also a lot for um, uh, the resident trout. And they uh, typically can be imitated with a small wet fly that's kind of a lavender or purple in color. And uh, the, the trout really go bananas about these. Um, just another really interesting fish to imitate that most fish have bottom feeding or most rivers have bottom feeding fish that reproduce yet for whatever reason, their fry is kind of neglected as a food source. So if your river has big runs of trash bottom feeding fish, um, don't hesitate to look at their fry as a food source. And uh, that's something that we do through the spring. A lot of times we're using either a single handed rod with a light uh, sinking leader on it, or we're using a switch rod uh, that's designated for trout with a, with a uh, floating line with a sink tip on the end. Um, if you ever fish for trout with a, a sinking leader like that, uh, in this neck of the woods, the only thing that's different from my perspective about fishing for resident trout versus uh, steelhead is that, or, uh, or a lake run brown for that matter, is that the resident fish definitely prefer if you activate the fly, that is to say, if you give it a, 
couple twitches and then a pause and let it swing and then a couple twitches and a pause and let it swing and compared to our migratory fish where it's usually the the deader the swing the better so um, that's just something I've noticed it might be different for you but uh, I kind of make that's uh, for this river system that works really really well so uh, whenever you're imitating bait fish the one thing you always have to take it into account is what what part of the bait fish you're looking at. And uh, if your fly is floating near the surface of the river, if you're fishing it high in the water column, then you probably want to be imitating the belly of that bait fish. You saw how that went over us and that was a sculpin and that's kind of a dark brown or an olive on top. And when you look at it from below, it's kind of a cream color. And so uh, that's why a lot of people who fish streamer patterns, you can see the big yellow streamer that this really good angler is casting uh you can see why a lot of times they use big yellow flies because they're they're the fish are reacting to uh the belly color of of the bait of the bait fish that they like to eat and so uh even right now when i'm i've got a bass fishing trip tomorrow and uh, i'm hoping to catch some pike too so i tied some really big gobies and these imitate the belly color of the goby which is Kind of a yellowy pink or a yellowy olive and so um, you can see when you're tying uh, bait fish patterns it's always important to have some in your box that imitate when you're fishing above the fish but some when you're fishing below the fish and this is a sculpin imitation that i would be fishing on the bottom and you can see if a predator fish is looking at that bait fish from the side he's going to say to himself okay, well, the sculpin that I like to eat from the side is kind of that mottled color. And so if you're fishing really close to the bottom, you definitely want to throw a fly that's a mottled color. And if you look carefully, you'll see the mottled colored fly on the right here and then the sculpin on the bottom on the left. So that's kind of just the po point of this picture. Sculpins are pretty good photo subjects. They think that we can't see them. So if you set a fly next to them, they just kind of sit there and they let you take their picture and then they eventually swim away. Just so you know, if you're fishing, if you're, if you're looking at sculpins, when they flee, they flee in pretty fast bursts and then a pause, and then a really fast burst and then a pause. And so if you're stripping a fly, it really helps to give it a, a strip and a pause with sculpin imitations because though they can go very quickly, they can only do it for a short, short distance. And so now I'm gonna kind of move on and I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the different things about um, what I see just about general fishing for migratory fish with uh, both with these attractor and with the um, bait fish patterns that I showed you. A lot of times if you come to a river in the fall and I'm sure it's the same just about everywhere if the conditions are really nice, if it's a 65 degree day and um, it's there's no wind and it's beautiful fall colors, you know, everybody that you know will be heading to the river and going fishing. And so you have to be able to read the water and find kind of creative ways to, in creative places to fish when the water's like that. And that's kind of how this next uh, section is going to be structured. Uh, and they can be busy just about anywhere. This spot is really well known for being busy. This is uh, 6th Street Dam in Grand Rapids. Uh, on a busy day and when there's fish around you'll almost always see a lot of fishermen but even there if somebody wants to be successful uh, the most successful anglers are the ones that are creative about how they approach the fish and another thing that's bad about fishing those beautiful beautiful days is not only the crowds but it also makes you more and more visible to the fish and the really strong directional lighting um, makes it so that you have to be picky about how and where to fish. And so um, you have some options on those really bright days. You can maybe find a smaller stream that has more shade on it and choose that day to go fish uh, the smaller stream. Um, we have a lot of different rivers that have different widths to choose from. And um, if it's a really bright day, you might choose going to that smaller place. The thing about any fish is that they don't have eyelids, so they cannot hide from the shade. And so uh, it's a really simple, straightforward thing, but it's the truth. They, one of the reasons fish are so fickle is that they, in sunny conditions, uh, 
is that they don't have the ability to, you know, sh shut their eyes. And so, um, and another problem that they have, no matter what size they are, is that there's always various predators out looking about. This is a, a predatory, uh, an osprey that I took a photo of uh, a couple weeks ago. It was uh, fishing in front of the boat launch where they had stocked some trout and lo and behold, this one was taking two out at a time. Um, and this is just one from a couple days ago that had found a much bigger trout. But my point being that fishing on sunny days, a trout has good reason to be afraid because there are things, whether it's a trout or a steelhead, uh, or, uh, you know, there are things that could prey on them. And so they're naturally wary on days when they're exposed to people and to other predators. And so you can, uh, you could fish a smaller river on such a day, or you could go and you could choose fishing in the morning or the evening hours. So the morning, you'll probably have um, your first crack at fish that haven't seen a fly. And if the numbers are light in your river of fish, then that might be good to hit it first thing in the morning and have first crack at the fish. As the fish settle in, the evening would probably be just as good when the crowds have thinned. And even though the fish might have seen a fly or a bead or a lure at that point, um, they uh, might still perk up as the crowds dissipate. And uh, so these are just simple ways so you can com combat bad lighting conditions. But then we start thinking about what's really good lighting conditions. And to me, uh, the perfect lighting conditions are kind of a partly cloudy um, condition that the river's been stable, the weather's been stable for a few days and you have kind of a mix of clouds and sun. That's okay because that sun kind of illuminates your fly and the clouds kind of keep the fish from being wary. But also when I'm going to the river in the morning and I see that the sky is red in the morning and a storm is approaching, it's usually as those storms approach that the fishing can be really, really good at some point. Although it might not be perfectly consistent, you'll probably be successful on those days. And it might be worth sitting out in the rain with an umbrella if you're, if you're so inclined to catch a big fish. So that kind of shifts during the winter months. I actually tell people during the dead of winter when the days are sh so short here um, that actually morning is not a good time to fish uh, and that the sunshine is good. And, uh, um, and so during the, during the winter months, you'll actually want to wait until the water temperature rises a little bit and then lean towards that afternoon fishing uh, during the winter. And that afternoon fishing will bring a couple degrees of water temperature. A lot of times if you fish in an area that has a darker bottom, uh, the water temperature will come up. And if you're fishing a streamer type fly or a bait fish imitation that's active, such as a, a swinging presentation or a stripping presentation, uh, that extra couple degrees of water temperature will make all the difference uh, to your success at fishing. And so you'd avoid this type of scene and you might lean rather towards the evening when um, the fishing, when the water temperature is a little bit warmer and you can be successful. Um, winter fishing for us is, uh, you know, typically in a Midwest stream, they tell me that uh, on a typical year, 30 to 40% of our fish come in and stay through the winter. Uh, and then during the spring, the other 60% of the fish arrive and they all kind of spawn together. Um, I think these winter fish typically are early spawning fish. So um, that's, that's good news because they're, if their young hatches a little sooner, they have a little better chance of surviving through the summer. And so these winter fish are really important to our fishery. As we head towards the end of winter in our streams, you can almost feel an explosion of life in the river. And on the right, you can see uh, the picture of the Two, uh, two different food sources that really blossom in the spring. There's salmon fry that are hatching at the top right, and there's stone flies that are hatching, and their nymphs kind of migrate to the edge of the river before they hatch. And what that does is it triggers a lot, uh, kind of a chain reaction of activity. And so even though it's a totally different thing, it's when that starts happening that you can start going back to those attractor flies like that big pile of flash on the left and be successful um, with these migratory fish. 
And each one of these rivers that we have in the, in the Midwest and, and just about everywhere has different currents. And uh, if you understand the different currents in our rivers, it'll help you learn how to fish those bait fish patterns that I showed you. One current that we fish a lot when there's debris on the water, such as a lot of fallen leaves in the winter, is what's called a crossover. It's where the current shifts from one side of the river to the other. And a lot of times the fish will sit on the inside of that when the water is cool. And you would cast a heavy weighted fly past that and uh, you would let it sink a little bit. And then you'd let the swing of the, the weight of the fly line swing it across. And, and that's what might bring you a big lake run brown or, uh, but you notice that this fly is very heavily weighted and that's typical of something that you'd use in that crossover because you'd be using that fly to get get through the current and uh, sink as you head into the debris cover of that uh, current seam that goes to the middle. Another thing that we often look for when we fish, uh, especially early in the fall and then late in the spring, is places where the current is pinched. And that's usually due to a gravel bar on each side of the river and it creates a um, food highway in the middle of the river. A lot of times there's eggs of king salmon or um, coho salmon or steelhead or lake run browns or in the spring sucker eggs. And, and all those food sources are getting funneled through an area of like this. And this is a perfect place uh, to swing a egg sucking leech or something of that nature. So that's another type of bottom that we look for. Another thing that's really useful to look for is uh, places where springs come into our rivers because they provide not only some really sweet water for the fish to congregate at, but a lot of them, even if they're there in the fall, are still thinking ahead to the spring when they might go up those little tiny creeks to spawn. So those areas that are close to springs, a lot of times will hold higher numbers of migratory fish. And this is just a picture of one of our um, resident or one of our migratory steelhead going up a very, very tiny creek. And this is something that happens all the time in the spring. And uh, they, a lot of times their eggs will provide food at the mouth of that creek. But um, we also have things like resident or uh, migratory king salmon, which have been around since the 70s. Uh, and they spawn in small tributaries. Typically, we don't fish for them in these small tributaries when they're doing their thing. We rely on them for natural reproduction. Um, but we also have coho salmon, uh, which also provide eggs. They're not nearly as successful at reproducing as the king salmon are in a lot of our rivers. Uh, but they do take swung flies and activated attractor flies very, very well. So, and typically the colors that we use here are probably similar to out west pink and um, pink and yellow and black. They all are good for the coho salmon. And fishing at the swinging a fly at the mouth of these uh, small tributaries, a lot of times when the salmon are spawning, that's a great place to look for a migratory steelhead because um, like anything that's closely related to ram rainbow trout, they have a real taste for eggs. And so they will be uh, located where that egg source is. And if you have a highway of eggs coming out of a small creek, um, there will be a steelhead there. Even if there aren't eggs coming through at the moment, you know, a lot of times the, the migratory fish reproduce more at night, but the steelhead will still be sitting there. And that's always a good thing to look for in the fall and again in the spring. And uh, here's a picture of a steelhead heading back after spawning in a small creek. And uh, this is a, a drop back fish that was caught at the mouth of one of those small creeks. A lot of times we'll pick up drop back steelhead, not only, um, sometimes we'll swing for them in the big rivers that have a lot of food, they'll recover their strength quite a bit before uh, going back to the lake. Uh, but also um, we'll catch them incidentally when we're swinging small wet flies for trout, which can be quite a kick when you're fishing a four or five weight rod and you catch one of these beautiful fish on a wet fly. You know, uh, rocky areas and islands provide a great place to find migratory fish in our rivers when you fish around these areas, uh, any place that has rocks is a great place to um, fish a 
a sculpin pattern or a darter pattern because those are fish that thrive along the rocky areas of the river. This is actually a really old uh, logging bridge on the river. It's over 100 years old and our rivers were initially decimated by the logging. Uh, it took care of all of our huge pine trees along the river, totally wiped out a lot of our native fish species and that's why uh, in the Great Lakes we have such a niche for migratory fish because a lot of the things that were initially here just haven't haven't done as well since the logging days. So, um, so in a way it's kind of benefited some aspects of our fishery. But again, when you're fishing around those islands and around those rocks, throw things that look like uh, the food sources there. This, believe it or not, is actually a sculpin imitation, though it's been thoroughly mauled by that uh, small steelhead. So in these islands that we have, we also have islands in the river that typically have good fishing along one side or the other. This gentleman is fishing the deep side of an island and uh, islands have a couple different um, different characteristics if you're fishing around an island you know um, some islands are small and you can basically think of them as just being a big boulder uh, and uh, but a larger island might have one side that's very shallow and another side that has a really deep cut with a lot of timber and that's a great place to wade and look for a steelhead and that's what this gentleman is doing and so now I'm going to talk to you about timber not only by that island but just in general um, migratory fish in general, when they move into this river, they've been living in, you know, sometimes a couple hundred feet of water and they move into our rivers and they just look for structure just like any other fish. They feel vulnerable, um, especially when they first come in, they're very sensitive to, you know, human traffic and such. So um, learning how to fish around structure can really help you when they first come in, but also when they become pressured because there's probably 90% of the anglers are fishing in ways that they don't wanna um, you know, fish around a fallen tree. They might get their other type of presentation like nymphing or somebody that's fishing bait or whatever, they might get a lot of the snags around the timber so they might not wanna fish. Or furthermore, the timber areas might only hold a, a smaller number of fish, but they might be more grabby, which lends itself well to uh, streamer types of fishing or bait fish types of fishing. And so learning how to fish the timber can be very important. And if you master the timber on a small river, you can do very well. This is the Pure Marquette River, which is a very famous river. And a lot of the fishing in the Pure Marquette is fishing around the timber. And this is Jeff Hubbard, who's a really well-known uh, fishing guide. If you ever go to the Pure Marquette, he's, he's a great guy to look up. Um, but it's also true in the lower parts of the big rivers that have a lot of timber. Um, just about every river has a lot of timber, but the lower reaches of our rivers have a historic reason for the timber because there's still a lot of old logging timbers uh, from a hundred years ago. You know, where I live in West Michigan was actually cut down. Our, tre our trees were cut down in mass to provide lumber for Chicago, which had just been burned to the ground in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So. Um, so there's a lot of timber still stuck in the bottom of our rivers that has been preserved and pro uh, provides really great fish habitat. Um, if you're fishing around these timber laden areas, you know, uh, one piece of advice I could use is always use really heavy tippet in those areas. It seems like common sense. A lot of times when you're fishing a streamer or a swung fly pattern, you can get away with heavy tippet anyways, but especially when you have to yank it out of cover, you know, uh, migratory fish who's been sitting right by cover's first instinct will be to run to cover. And over the years, I've had some really crazy experiences where fish have jumped over logs onto shore and then gone underneath. And so it's a good thing to be geared heavily and not to be afraid uh, to, to play a fish hard if you get them near timber. Um, for me personally, I use flies that have a heavy braid a tail behind them, you could, or a loop behind them to put the hook on. And most commonly I'll use Power Pro, but you could also use beetle on wire or Senyo wire. Um, these are all good ways to do it. Uh, they all have their pluses and minuses. For me, I like the action of, of braid, but you have to be very careful of how you apply it. Usually when I tie it on a fly, I put an overhand knot in the end of it. And then I put it through the eye of the hook before I tie over it. And that 
prevents the fly from ever breaking if you go into timber. The other real advantage to using a, a fly with a replaceable hook is that if you're fishing around timber, you might choose a hook that you can bend out of the timber in case you just, by nature of the amount of snags, you just keep getting snagged and you don't want to lose the fly. So you use a bendable hook and um, it's a hook that's heavy enough to catch a migratory fish, but yet it's light enough that if you need to bend it out of a snag, you can, you can do it. And that's just one other reason why you might use a replaceable hook other than just the hook gap. Another place that has kind of comical uh, wood to fish around is a lot of times in the mouths of our rivers. And a lot of times in my free time, I'll fish these kind of difficult to navigate areas. Um, they're not places I typically take clients because they can be um, pretty, pretty tight as you can see, but, but um, a lot of times the fish down in these areas are chrome and fresh even during the middle of the winter and it can make for some very, very challenging casting, but a 10 foot cast in these braided areas of our rivers can make for some of the most exciting strikes from big fish and so that's why I personally love to fish them. I don't usually guide these areas, but they're great for fishing and they can result in some really big um, migratory fish um, like this migratory brown trout. Another thing that you might do around the timber areas is you might fish a fly with a really big head. I showed you earlier uh, some of the sculpin attractor flies that I tied that were really big, had a really big front to them. And the reason isn't just to imitate the head of a sculpin, and it's also to make the fly more buoyant. And if I know that I'm fishing around snags that are at a certain depth, I can put on one of these more buoyant flies and I can fish around trouble to some degree. And usually the strikes that you get with these big uh, sculpin patterns are pretty jolting. So that um, makes for some good fun. If you're ever looking fishing around timber, this is something I look for and hopefully it makes sense for you guys watching. I look for the downstream current and I look for trees that have fallen that have downstream limbs and the steelhead and the migratory brown trout and a lot of times stream trout will be sitting right at the seam that's formed behind these trees. And I'm, I know it's true in the Midwest, I'm guessing it's true a lot of places, but um, basically what I'll do is, you know, a lot of times I'm fishing from a boat. So I have the advantage of casting beyond the seam and then I'll let it sink in that soft water that's on the shore side of the seam. And I'll mend and I'll mend until the fly gets to hit the bottom. And then I'll activate it by letting the line tighten. The seam will pull the line across the current and it'll sing, swing the fly beautifully through there. And a lot of times that'll catch the fish. And it's just a really fun thing to go down a brushy part of the river and cast behind every fallen tree that comes out at this format. So one other thing that you might think about is, and it's a strange thing to see a picture of, is where other types of fish live in the summer. You know, and uh, in, in the case of the river that I'm on, I look a lot for weed beds because weed beds have a lot of food in them and eventually they die in the winter, but the food that lives in their roots and the food that lives in the actual weeds is still present. It doesn't go very far. They're small food sources and it's not gonna travel very far. And so those areas that are really fertile with weeds, you know, typically have a lot of food for a migratory fish. And that might be impetus for a migratory fish to hang out in that area. And those areas provide food for the stream trout in the summer. They provide food for the smallmouth bass in that last slide. Um, and then when those weed beds are dead, that's when they provide food uh, for the migratory fish like steelhead uh, and also for the resident trout during the winter months. Uh, fishing around those weedy areas can be very, very successful. Usually when I'm fishing at any time of the year, I'm carrying a couple different types of lines. For ease of casting, I typically do use Skagit type lines. And I'll typically have one that's rigged with an intermediate line that's just designed to swing across the current. You don't interfere with it very much. And then a lot of times I'll carry a floating rig, a floating line, typically also a Skagit line with a, a sink tip of, of length on the end. And I'll use that line when I'm fishing by seams, when I wanna cast past a seam and mend, it, mend the fly to the bottom, that, that floating line will give me the ability and then I'll allow the current to tow 
that line across the current after the fly has been, reached the bottom. So there's a couple different approaches. Uh, you know, generally in the fall, I'm much more heavy towards the intermediate line, which just does a basic swing. But then during the winter months and the early spring, I'm typically using a floating line where I have more control. So, and uh, I can fish it more slowly. And so, uh, you know, sometimes we'll fish steelhead and migratory fish until they leave when they're, uh, you know, done spawning, they provide good sport on a swung fly, especially if they have a really good food source. You know, some rivers, uh, our fish as they drop out aren't, aren't a good target. They're, it, they're, they're exhausted from spawning, but other rivers, they recover very quickly. And uh, as they get closer and closer to the lake, they provide some good fishing. So um, that's just kind of how we end our spring. Whenever you fish for steelhead or any other fish, there's one other thing that I look for, and that's what we call a prime lie. And in the middle of this picture, you can see a brown trout in the middle of this, this lie, this four foot deep spot that provides a perfect ambush place for a predator. And uh, that prime lie is great for a brown trout. And then in the summer, I might catch a smallmouth bass in that same spot and uh, a brown trout, you know, like I showed you the picture of sitting there. And in the winter, I might catch a steelhead out of that same spot. And I'm always looking for these really prime feeding areas. And a lot of times when I'm guiding in the summer, because the water's so low and clear, I can look at a spot that I caught a big smallmouth bass out of or a big trout. And I can say, hey, you know, if, there, if that fish is there then, during the winter months, I bet a, a, a migratory fish will be in that area. And so um, the times of the year are all connected. And when you're out fishing in the spring and summer, always be thinking that this might apply later on to your migratory fish fishing if that waterway has migratory fish in it. And just look for these really prime feeding areas where a predator fish can ambush a bait fish because they're all looking for dinner. So, and uh, there's a steelhead. And when you uh, fish, you know, love these fish and try to let them go. and um, let them do their thing, and uh, maybe they'll be there for you the next week or the next year. Thank you for watching my program. This is this is my guide service. I have a few videos, and I also have that book that that, that uh, April mentioned that I'd love to sell for you. I have a small website, swingabigfly.com, but also any fly shop in the Midwest might would likely ha have it, or you can buy it from some of the big box stores like Amazon. That's my plug. I hope you guys enjoyed the program. Kevin, thank you so much. I'm just posting the link right now. It's swingabigfly.com. Correct. Yep. All right. That is in the if, Facebook comments. All right. If you wanted an autograph copy, that would be where you would go. But I'm just happy anybody buys it anywhere. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it's an okay. excellent uh, Father's Day gift, too. That's the other thing. You know, Ooh, yes. around the corner. Yep. It's an excellent book. I, like I said, I've got it here in front of me right now, and it is absolutely. I, I honestly, Kevin, this is one of the best books I've I've got in my library. It's really, really thorough and impressive, and so visually pleasing because your photos are amazing. <laughs> Thanks, April. I really, really appreciate it. So. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Um, let's do some questions. So let me head on over here. Uh, Rick says, "Well done, absolutely." Anyone else have questions? Go ahead and start posting them up. Same with Facebook. Let me go on here and have a look. All right, I'm sure there are some coming. So let's just wait a second, sure. Kevin. Sometimes uh, it takes a while to get the fingers going. Here we go. Um, do you sync tips? Do you use sync tips? Would you like to elaborate on your sync tip method? Sure, absolutely. Um, in fact, I would say that I kind of live and die by sink tips because, you know, in, in these areas, our, our water temperature crashes pretty quickly and it stays really cold for a long time. So, you know, without sink tips, I wouldn't be able to do it. Most commonly, I'm using T14. Um, uh, if the water's at a normal level, if we have a year where our average water depth is, is normal, I'll use T14. T14, that's in lengths from anywhere from seven or eight feet all the way to 15 feet. Um, 
if the water clarity becomes extreme, if it becomes low water, I'll use something thinner like a sinking leader or a, uh, a length of T8 or, or T11, something like that. Uh, or I'll buy a, a mo tip or something like that that has a, a lighter sink rate. So, um, but typically in early in the fall when the water temperature is warm, we're using pretty light sink tips, you know, on the Muskegon River where I'm based, seven or eight feet of T14 would do it. Um, and then during the winter months, it bumps up to 10 or 12 feet. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's times during the winter where it gets a little more complicated because I might actually use less T14, but I use a much heavier fly because I'm trying to physically mend the fly down to the bottom to get it to nick the bottom before I actually let it kick free and swing. So, um, but the, the short answer is, yeah, now uh, we do use a lot of sink tips. That's not necessarily true for everywhere in the Midwest, you know, the smaller streams, you'd use less, less sink tip. Um, and then as you go to other parts of the Midwest, like Ohio or New York, you might find times where you're using a floating line or really light sink tip. So uh, it does vary a lot around the Midwest, but I'd say in general, our fishing is sink tip fishing. Well, that's a perfect segue into Devin's question. Can you expand on when you use intermediate lines versus floating and when you make the transition? Sure, that's a great question. So um, if I had to choose one or the other, um, it would be a tough choice, but I probably 60% or more of the fishing we do on a given year is with the intermediate lines. And that's because, you know, they allow the fly to sink very evenly and they come across, and I'm not really trying to slow down the fly per se with an intermediate line. I'm just trying to get it deep. Um, and that's fine if I'm choosing water that's I have to be really particular about the water I choose though as it gets cold because if I can only sink the fly and not control the speed of it, you know, I can't fish um, water that the fly is moving too quickly. I don't know if that makes sense. So, so the intermediate line, though it gets the fly very deep, it doesn't offer you the control of the floating line. So once the water temperature gets to be 37 or 35, that's when I switch almost exclusively to the floating line, which gives me the ability to not only manipulate the fly to get it to the bottom, but also it allows me, because it's sitting on the surface, it allows me to touch it to the current and tow the fly across the river if I'm fishing a very slow part of the river. So um, generally speaking, the intermediate line is through the fall and early winter, and then the floating line is what I use through the winter months. Um, but even that varies a little bit depending on what part of this river system I'm fishing. So <laughs> hopefully that, but that's a good general answer, I think, so. Okay, David asks, uh, he says, you mentioned gobies in the presentation. Let me, sorry, yep. move this chat over. For Northern Pike, any other imitations you would recommend for pike in the Midwest? Well, uh, you know, for, for pike in the Midwest, a goby is a really good starting point. Um, for, for this river system, it's got to be big, and gobies are pretty big forage base. But also, you know, we use a lot of big shiner patterns, things that imitate those common shiners, um, and just general attractors. If I had to choose one color combination and I just wanted to catch a pike, I would go with yellow and pink every day and twice on the weekend, you know. So, um, so if you're fishing in Michigan in a river, I would say, try something big and yellow and pink and then have some big goby patterns like that big yellow one I showed you earlier would be a great choice. Perfect. Um, Christopher, hello, Chris. That photo presentation was so enjoyable. It sure was. Uh, felt like a great day on the river with you. Really like the predator bird shots and the steely shooting out from the log. Question on casting behind the log structure. While waiting for the fly to sink, are you mending to the downstream are you mending downstream so the current doesn't move the fly right away? You know, it really depends on how you're, how you're doing it. If, if the log is, if you're, a lot of times for me, I'll be fishing just the downstream tip of the log. So that's the very ending of the log. So I'll actually be out of harm's way with that. I'll be casting past the seam created by the log. But if you're fishing right up against the timber, um, you know, there's ways that you can kind of, you know, some of the really good anglers that I've known, 
one of the tips I picked up from Jeff Liskey, who's a really great angler uh, who fishes a lot of tight stuff in Ohio. And, you know, one thing I heard from him is to use a really, really short leader because you always know exactly where your fly is when you're fishing around timber. And that's, to me, that was a great piece of advice that I've used many times since I've heard him say it. And so that might be a tip that you might use around timber as well. So hopefully that answers your question. Perfect. I have a question. Yes. Have, have you read Topher Brown's Atlantic Salmon Magic book? <laughs> Not yet. I hope to. I haven't, uh, since I've had the kids, I haven't had much time to do much than blaze of glory every night, tying flies and uh, getting ready for the next day. So, um, oh, yeah. and, and then I have a hard time not fishing when I do have free time. So, well, um, here's why I, I ask. So he has a theory and I might butcher it, but it's something that's very interesting. I believe that he says that he feels that a small bait fish can't move as fast as a larger bait fish. And so when he's determining the speed in which to swing his fly, he thinks to himself, that is a great fly of this size move this fast or this slow. That is exactly right. And that's something I should have touched on, especially when I was talking to you about those fry patterns that I showed earlier. Um, because, um, for example, I can fish a sculpin pattern pretty fast, even though that's not necessarily the natural speed of the fish but but when I'm fishing really small food sources like a sculpt or a, a, a steelhead or fry or salmon fry or a, a darter for that matter you can't get too carried away with speed it has to be fished pretty slow either the fly has to be weighted and the friction with the bottom of the river slows the fly down or um, you just have to be in a little bit of contact with the bottom with your sink tip with smaller patterns or uh, you just have to choose water that's slower so that the, the fly doesn't go as fast. But um, that's a very, very good question. Those, any of those smaller food sources, you really wanna slow down the, the, the presentation even if the water temperature is high um, because they, the fish just won't invest the energy to feed on a small natural food source if they have to burn as much energy to get to it to eat it so right there you so go were all of those patterns flies that you personally would swing or were some more suitable for stripping uh almost everything you saw in that video or in my presentation i'm sorry were um flies that i would swing except uh let me think here the big the big yellow gobies that i tied those were i'm actually guiding tomorrow with those so um, you know, those are um, specific, specifically for being stripped. Whoops, I guess I turned my heat now count on. I can see. And, uh, yep, there we go. So anyways, uh, yeah, so the vast majority of the flies in this presentation were designed to be strong. Um, this particular fly here, if you can see it, uh, is actually something that you could swing very slowly or you could uh, also fish as a nymph with a nymph and indicator rig uh, or some kind of bottom presentation, it works very well. And that's, uh, you know, nymphing with a bait fish pattern is another way that you can slow down a very small pattern, so. Perfect, well, I'm yep. excited. We've got a time night with Kevin coming up soon. It's interactive, so rather than this sort of format, uh, it will be so that we can see each other and converse and hang out. And so that's members only. So for those of you who are members on here, I see a bunch of you, uh, obviously I'll see you there. And if you're not a member, you can sign up at anchor.doors.com. I put Kevin's link in. Kevin, can you tell us again where people can find you to book a guided day? Because that to me is the, that's where everyone should probably start. Where can they find you? Sure. Uh, so my website is feenstraoutdoors.com. And Feenstra is a funny Dutch name with an F. F-E-E-N-S-T-R-A outdoors.com. And you can reach me through that anytime. Uh, um, I can be, the quickest responses for me is always uh, email or text. Um, and uh, just because of the nature of my life right now. <laughs> but anyways, I would love to hear from you, so. Awesome, well, look, I cannot thank you enough for making time. I know you're busy, three kids, set of twins, full guiding service, you're 
busy. So thank you very much. And I hope that we get to see you again soon. Well, we will, but I hope that uh, we can do another one of these again soon. It's always a pleasure, April. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye.